four million years later. Hi there, thank you for downloading and listening to the 4 Million Years Later podcast. This is a show where two old friends get together, watch an episode of the Generation 1 Transformers cartoon series in order, story order. More on that on our Facebook page. We're longtime fans of the show. We, we first encountered it as children. We loved it as kids. We continue to love it into our teen and young adult years. And here we are as not quite so young adults watching it again and getting together and reflecting on this show from the perspective of how we engaged with it as children and how we think about it as adults today. My name is Jersey Drost. I am a cartoonist and teaching artist, and the other host is named... I am Hoover the Night Turd. Oh, jeez. <laughs> you genuinely caught me off guard with that one. <laughs> Oh, I thought it was going to be like Night Hoove or something like that, but okay. <laughs> I do my best. <laughs> Which means we're at episode 26. We are talking about uh, the episode Enter the Night Bird, which is written by whom? Richard Milton and Sylvia Wilson. And we have not seen these names before on a Transformers episode. Reality has barely seen their names on any episode of any kind. Milton's only other writing credit is two episodes of Marcus Welby, M.D., and Wilson had no other credit listed at all. Interesting. Huh. I'd like to know the story behind that. Well, I think probably what I can guess with all these unknowns involved is that they were like, come on, we need scripts. We need scripts for season two. We're Throwing 49 episodes into this season, too. We need scripts. <laughs> you guys know anyone who ever wrote anything? Fine. Send them my little Transformers Bible here. Make them write a script. I wish I would have known that going in and rewatching it again. And I would have been I would have been paying more close attention to, you know, if there was any like thing that stood out as being very unusual. Like when Optimus calls up Marcus Welby, MD? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I thought that was a little strange at first, but then when I, once I discovered this, I was like, oh. Yeah. That's a bit of a tell. Is this an episode that you have uh, a lot of familiarity with from your childhood? Because I this is one that made it onto the VHS tapes that I had as a kid, and I watched it a lot. This felt very familiar to me as a for a season two episode, but what about you? Yeah, it felt familiar. I don't know if I ever had it on VHS, but I it was definitely one of those that stuck in my mind. Probably mm-hmm. just because the whole ninja aspect and... In the 80s, everybody loved them some ninjas, so. Yeah. N- it's a very was... memorable episode, but I, I don't necessarily remember watching it as a kid, but I'm sure I did. There's a, a handful of moments that really stand out. Is like when I saw them again, I was like, yes, I can close my eyes and still see that particular scene. But this is another one where I wouldn't put it like, I would say this is one where, where I, I, if you asked me before I watched it again, I'm like, yeah, it's a pretty good episode. And upon watching it again, I'm like, yeah, it's a pretty good episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's, a, there's, there's a number of things that I, I think are really nice about it. But fair warning to the Decepticon fans in the room. You know, there's a little bit of Decepticon internal struggle happening in this, but we really don't get to see. It's mostly the Autobots chasing around Nightbird, right? Yeah. Well, I guess we better just dive in and do it. And for those who are playing along at home, if you want to watch this episode, you want to pause it and watch it and then listen to our commentary on it, it's on Tubi.tv, and this is listed as uh, Season 2, Episode 6 in their listing, even though this is, well, I guess that works with this. This is Episode 26, Season 2, Episode 6. All right, there we go. So go go watch it and then come back and listen to see if you agree or disagree. And whether you agree or disagree, we want to hear from you, and you can listen for the very end where we put all of our social contact info so you can let us know what you think all right ready for the log line hoof mm-hmm. all right here we go dr fujiyama has created a ninja robot called nightbird when the decepticons steal her the autobots must try to rescue nightbird without harming her mm-hmm. yeah that's basically what happens yeah a female ninja robot called nightbird <laughs> <laughs> okay so Start us off. Please tell me Victor Caroli comes back to set the scene. No, sadly, no Victor Caroli this episode. Oh. But we begin with the Autobots in the Ark redoing the floor. Oh, Apparently there pretty- was a special on Spanish tile at the Home Depot, maybe? No. <laughs> so Wheeljack has made these things called detection panels and demonstrates that if metal touches them while they're plugged in, it sounds the alarm. So they're redoing the floor in case the Decepticons try to sneak in 
But the Autobots are metal too, so I guess they'll just turn them on when they're not at home or only around the entrance where no one's walking. It's a bit vague and confusing, but it will come up again later in the episode. Can we describe what these things look like? Because like this is this is one of those things where it's like, okay, yes, it's a visual medium, and we have to make sure that we do it in a way that kids will remember later on in the episode. But they're just like little gold panels that like light up, like like glow mm-hmm. with electricity, right? And which kind of makes it like, well, that's a weird security device because Decepticons can fly, one. And secondly, it's like mm-hmm. you're drawing attention to it. You don't put a neon light around the thing that you want the intruder to trip over. But <laughs> this is the limitation of a cartoon series that's 20 minutes long. You know, it's like, okay, well, what, how do we do this in a way that the, when characters engage with this later, the kids will instantly remember, oh, yeah, that's the thing that Wheeljack made at the top of the episode. But there we are. <laughs> and then suddenly Cliffjumper runs in saying they have an important call from Dr. Fujiyama, the famous scientist. He literally says that. (laughs) Dr. Fujiyama, the famous scientist. Dr. Fujiyama, the famous scientist. (laughs) Not 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 Dr. Fujiyama down the street. Not Dr. Fujiyama, who's the famous scientist. The obscure scientist. scientist. Yeah, we Mm. we only want the famous one. Dr. Fujiyama, the famous scientist. Mm. Uh, (laughs) So the handful of surrounding Autobots follow Prime to the view screen where we see an Asian man in a black business suit. He bows and greets Prime. He explains that he needs the Autobots to guard the unveiling of his latest invention, a special robot. At the risk of seeming boastful, it is the greatest robot ever created by man, which means it is (laughs) primitive by Autobot standards. My curiosity is aroused. We will come, Doctor. Oh, splendid, splendid. All the top scientists of the world will be on hand for the unveiling. And the call ends. Dr. Fujiyama, the famous scientist, is being portrayed by Michael Bell, a.k.a. Sideswipe and Prowl. And this is one of those things that I feel like, you know, I, I keep pushing back into this idea of, like, it doesn't hold up. Well, this is something that actually doesn't hold up. It's like when you see, like, the way... I don't feel like this is like really loud in 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 your face, like feeling like out of anachronistic or like written by people who are tone deaf. But, you know, it's close. It feels out of place to hear that kind of representation of a character and like having him bow and the whole bit and everything anyway. Well, in the 80s, there were no Asian actors. So I, apparently, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it, it gets worse in Kremzeek. <laughs> yes. When we get to Kremzeek, it gets very bad. But I feel like this is right up against the line where I'm just like, oh, yeah, that doesn't feel so good when I watch that now. However, when we flip to flip the coin, say like parts that do feel good, as they're talking, we get this really great, rarely seen shot of a pan of the Autobot standing in front of Teletran 1 from Teletran 1's perspective. Right, so we're looking mm-hmm. at the Autobots as Doctor Fujiyama is talking. Doctor Fujiyama, Fujiyama is the famous scientist. I think we should say that every yep. time we say his name mm-hmm. in this episode. <laughs> but it's worth stopping and looking at the screen on this particular part if you're just listening to the episode while it's on, while they're having that discussion that we just heard. It looks really nice. The art in this episode is great. There's a lot of really great shots. So yeah, definitely. So Wheeljack and Ironhide immediately start chuckling, imagining how primitive this Earth robot will be. Prime Mm -hmm. reigns them in, saying they'll go and make certain the Decepticons don't get their hands on it. And Prime declares, let's roll! So apparently this is happening now, and Dr. (laughs) Fujiyama, the famous scientist, was operating rather last minute. Just just like in the Autobot run, where it's Mm -hmm. like Spike just ran home and said, like, Prime, you want to do a charity thing? Yeah, when? Right now! (laughs) The crowd's already there. We've already sold tickets. (laughs) <laughs> there is no wait time between when Optimus decides or when when you ask Optimus for help, help arrives immediately thereafter. <laughs> and maybe maybe they'll take Skyfire. Oh, they're not gonna take Skyfire. <laughs> <laughs> they're gonna drive. Okay. So we cut to the university where we see a dome shaped building, and inside we have multiple Autobots standing guard with chairs full of attendants present for the unveiling. Wheeljack and Ratchet are whispering about the robot, just really tearing it to pieces, wondering if batteries are included, etc., etc. And Prime walks by, reminding them, We're here to guard the robot, not to make jokes at its expense. Prime is always modeling the best behavior. Because, in about two seconds, he's going to turn a corner, and guess who's there? (laughs) So Prime walks up to the side of the stage and joins Jazz, Sparkplug, and Spike. See? 
this this is continuing to support my hypothesis that the writers, whether intentionally or not, wrote it so that the Autobots are always a little less good when Spike's not around and always a little better when Spike's around. <laughs> so then Dr. Fujiyama, the famous scientist, walks out on stage where his creation is draped in a sheet hidden away. He addresses the crowd, saying what they're about to see is state-of-the-art robotics. And with that, the sheet is lifted away, and the robot is revealed. A gray, black, and purple, vaguely feminine robot standing roughly 10 to 15 foot tall. Now see, this was his first mistake. He painted her gray right. and purple. It's, it's almost mm-hmm. just like saying, like he's, he, he subconsciously wanted this to happen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> So he can be Dr. Fujiyama, the even more famous scientist. (laughs) So he calls it the first female ninja robot named Nightbird. And she holds nunchucks in her right hand and has size on her wrist. The crowd is impressed, but Prime has a question for Spike. What is a ninja? An ancient Japanese warrior capable of amazing feats of skill and daring. So then a scientist in the crowd stands and asks Dr. Fujiyama, the famous scientist, isn't it dangerous to build a robot ninja? And then Dr. Fujiyama, the famous scientist, states that she's meant to assist mankind, not harm him. She's not meant for battle or assassinations. He literally says that line. (laughs) The robot holding nunchucks with size on her arms isn't meant for battle. Hmm. Yeah, okay. yeah. I I think Doctor Fujiyama, the famous scientist, is not a trustworthy narrator in this story. <laughs> I I mean, like, just like how we discovered Carly was so much better than we remembered. This guy, he's got some serious, you know, nasty stuff going on in the background with him. You you build something that looks like that, like, no, she's not for assassinations. Whoa, did anybody say assassination? I didn't say assassination. <laughs> So anyway, yeah, as he's as he's like calming the crowd and lying to them, apparently. <laughs> now we see Trailbreaker with his back to a Transformer-sized door watching the presentation. And he's so unwrapped, he doesn't notice the laser melting through the door, which hits him and sends him <laughs> flying across the auditorium, thankfully not flying into the crowd. This shot of him flying above everybody is pretty comical. It's a pretty funny looking shot. You almost expect a slide whistle <laughs> the way yeah. he flies over everybody's head. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also cool because Joe Bricker is kind of like in this weird crouch pose. It's like he's almost in an action pose, but halfway there, and then the door explodes behind him. And literally, like, you see him just fly into the camera, and then it's like the static side shot of the crowd sitting there, and then he just goes, woo, over their heads. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and then in run Rumble and Frenzy. Rumble immediately unleashes his pile drivers, sending the crowd running as Frenzy unleashes some laser fire. Jazz wants to leap in the battle, but Prime warns them that they can't risk hurting the humans. Laserbeak shoots his way through the roof and shoots a prowl, as the last of the humans then flee the scene. Now that it's safe to attack, Prime orders they retaliate. <laughs> and that's when Megatron and Soundwave Kool-Aid man their way in. Oh yeah! Literally <laughs> just walk right through the wall. Which is like the opposite of day of the machines where they went through all this trouble to sneak in right this is classic megatron he walks Mm -hmm. through the wall like he doesn't like kool-aid man is not quite a perfect comparison because kool-aid man like kind of comes out with both arms forward like oh yeah megatron's just like walking the way you would like walk to the kitchen to get something out of the Mm -hmm. fridge but like oh is there a wall there a wall in his way (laughs) yeah he's very nice he's like oh was that there i'm sorry but i'm here to like wreck up the place yeah (laughs) So then Megatron takes a shot at Prime as Blue Streak runs in to take the blast instead. The usual squaring off happens as Soundwave takes out Brawn, but an invisible mirage takes out Soundwave, causing this exclamation from Megatron. Mirage! Prepare to disappear! Permanently! So here we have another instance of Megatron referring to an Autobot by name, and I think this shows how the war has evolved and progressed. Four million years ago, it was half a planet full of Autobots versus half a planet full of Decepticons, and there were no personal vendettas. It was Autobot versus Decepticon, that's it. But now, they've been fighting on Earth a while. They have only a fraction of their armies at their command. Megatron has had to research the Autobots to figure out if any of them had the right part for a solar needle. He's gone after Wheeljack's inventions. He's had one-on-one dealings with these Autobots now, so he knows them by name. So I like that evolution and how things have become more personal. 
That's true. And Mirage has twice in the past mm. foiled Megatron's plan by like sneaking into his ship and turning invisible. So it seems like that would be something Megatron would remember, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. It makes a lot of sense that the backdrop is that this has been an eons long war between these two like gigantic peoples on this planet. And now there's like how many characters are there in the series at this point? I lost count, but but it's under 30, right? So No, no, it's more than 30, I think. Is it really? Oh, goodness. 44. Okay. Still, if you have 44 people encountering each other on a weekly basis like this or daily basis actually <laughs> the cartoon is daily at this point you know it's like yeah you're gonna start to learn about each other and as you pointed out megatron's mm-hmm. also like had a couple plots now where he's had to do research on the autobots so this makes perfect sense and i am not going to mourn the fact that the decepticons feel that the autobots are beneath their contempt and don't even say their names mm-hmm. so fight scene so prime grapples with megatron throwing off his aim thus saving mirage But girders from the roof fall and collapse onto Ironhide, distracting Prime, who runs off to the rescue. Megatron fires at Prime's back as Spike tries to warn him, but he's not quick enough. The pair get back into a tussle as we see the Seekers literally lift the roof off the place. Alright, let's let's scroll back just like four seconds. We have to address the fact that they got Frank Welker to do Optimus' grunts after he got shot in the back by Megatron. Hmm. Hoover, I, I put a link in the doc right there, and that actually goes to, the, to an MP3 of the file. You have to listen to it. You have to just listen <laughs> to the audio and respond to it. Interesting. Do it right now. Do it right now. Listen to it. Because he sounds like Dudley Do Right. <laughs> Optimus, look out! <laughs> that was prime. <laughs> yes. That was the, that's the sound that plays while Optimus is slowly falling to the ground after getting shot by Megatron. <laughs> oh, <Whoa>. that's crazy! <laughs> it just it sounds like a parody. It doesn't sound like it sounds like Frank Walker just like, like, like Wally Bird was like, just give us some grunts. What for? I'll just use them someplace. And he's like, Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> wow. so. <laughs> that kind of that kind of like interrupted the drama for me when I was watching this. I don't know why that was there, <laughs> but but I the moment I heard, it, I was like, did I just hear what I thought I heard? Hit like back thirty seconds, and sure enough, yeah. So that's worth paying attention for, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> But yes, like while we're too busy chuckling at the weird noises Optimus made, the, the Decepticons, honestly for true, rip the roof off of this giant dome mm-hmm. building, and it's like the three Seeker jets just like tore it off. And they lowered cables down to Nightbird and lift her out of the building. Prime is distracted long enough for Megatron to get the upper hand, and Megatron knocks Prime down and flees the auditorium with the other Decepticons. And we now cut to a mountainous area where a Decepticon symbol has been carved into the rock. Like a giant Decepticon symbol. It's huge. And it's even it's painted huge. purple. Yeah, yeah. I want to know the story behind that. Because Megatron didn't do it. He made somebody else do it. And I want to know what that planning session sounded like, right? It's like, well, this is our, <laughs> this is our new secret base. Oh, well, how secret is it going to be? We're going to make it a Decepticon symbol. <laughs> oh, okay, how big? Big enough that we can fly out of the center of the symbol in full robot mode. What? <laughs> <laughs> this thing get is get to like work, Decepticons. Get on it. <laughs> <laughs> and then you just like see Bone Crusher and Longhaul like shrug at each other, then start walking off camera <laughs> as they get ready to start moving boulders, but. It's like an extruded Decepticon symbol coming out of the ground, it almost looks like, but it's like carved out of the rock. It's gigantic. It is the weirdest base they've ever had in the series, hands down. (laughs) The Decepticons land, and then Megatron explains that this new base of theirs is only temporary, but will do nicely for this current plan against the Autobots. I guess they're really tired of wasting all that fuel flying back from the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. I guess so, but like, but I also like after our just our discussion about like the planning session for that base. When Megatron walks by, and says this will this is temporary, but it'll do. I see Longhall and Bone Crusher behind him, like throwing their papers up in the air and walking off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> what? It's temporary, but it still has to be in the shape of the Decepticon symbol, <laughs> and it has to be painted purple. We're like, only going to use it one time, but make sure it's perfect. I don't want to like put a really fine point on it, but like this kind of theatrics is not 
typical of Megatron, right? Like, yeah, he did the new Cybertron thing, but that was like terraforming Earth into a new Cybertron. He was trying to like take it over, make it his home. This is more like we're building a temporary base. Can you make it a great big de- giant Decepticon symbol? That's something mm-hmm. Cobra Commander does, not Megatron, mm-hmm. right? But okay, maybe maybe he's, like the Decepticons have, are flush with Energon lately. I don't know, but <laughs> it's weird. Well, now when you have the Constructicons at your beck and call, you can have them do whatever you want. I guess so. <laughs> so now we cut away and we see Nightbird on an operating table with Megatron and the Insecticon bombshell over her. Seems like he's been invited over as he knows a little something about reprogramming robots. He plans to reprogram Nightbird to serve the Decepticon cause through the use of a new chip he places into the back of her head. And when he produces the chip, it's a lovely shot where they do that trick where they create a sense of depth by just putting things in and out of focus. So like mm-hmm. you see Bombshell, as he says this line, by the way, this line, when I was watching this one as a kid, this this line really stuck with me. because It felt, I think it felt more menacing to my 10 or 11 year old brain than it actually was. But he says, I just love warping minds for you, Megatron. Mm-hmm. And he giggles and he says, and he's love it, you know. Yeah. But as he's saying that, we're looking at his face straight on and then he holds up his hand. It goes into the foreground of the camera and he's holding the chip and his hand and the chip are out of focus. And then the focus shifts and then his hand and the chip are in focus before he slips into Nightbird's head. And they don't do that trick a lot in the Transformers. They did it in Divide and Conquer. There's that part where Ironhide says, what a sorry sight for sore eyes as Starscream comes into the frame. But it feels like it's of that time. I don't see that trick being used a lot in animation today. It feels kind of like a late 70s, early 80s thing, but it's really pretty when they do it. So Mm. another scene worth underlining is is pointing out why this episode is especially nice in terms of visuals. Another little bit of trivia. When I was first on the internet in 94, 1994, kids, I was first experiencing the internet. There were already a couple of Transformer sites up. And this one I found had sound files, I think they were waves at the time, of basically a line from every one of the Transformers uh, in the the series. And Bombshell's line was this very one, I love warping minds for for you, Megatron. Love it! (laughs) Uh, So, like, for the longest time, I had saved onto... (laughs) <laughs> Three and a half inch discs, <laughs> wave files of Transformers talking. So. It, what's funny is like when I think about that time too is how like we hoarded that stuff because we never knew mm-hmm. when we would want it again or what, if we could ever find it again. And you never know when you might need a Transformers quote <laughs> at mm-hmm. some point in your life. <laughs> I still have all those files. Oh my gosh. I've converted them from wave to MP3, but I still have them all. Wow. So when when you finally make the new Hoover website, when it loads, it will play any one of those sounds from a random bank, right? (laughs) Sure. That was another thing from that time. It's like everybody had websites that upon loading played a sound. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. I certainly did. (laughs) So, okay, so he puts this chip in Nightbird's head. And once the chip is inserted, Nightbird gets up from the table and immediately (laughs) begins doing some ninja moves. (laughs) And this does not impress Starscream. She looks like some earthling play puppet. Yes, but this puppet has a punch. (laughs) So Megatron then asks Soundwave if she's ready for the task at hand. Affirmative. And what are her orders? To steal the world energy chip from the Autobots and then exterminate them. I don't know what a world energy chip is, but it definitely sounds like something Megatron would want. Yeah, it's it's got the word energy in it and world. Right. Those are both things that he likes. <laughs> <laughs> that like if if he had a favorite flavor of ice cream, it would have those two words in it. <laughs> <sighs> so we cut back to the university where Prime is apologizing for the utter failure of protecting Nightbird. Prime vows that they'll get her back, but first they need to get the wounded back to base. Braun tries to be tough, but he's hurt pretty bad, so they all roll for home. So this scene with Braun, yeah, he's like, he got shot in the shoulder by Soundwave. They showed it. Like, there's the, actually, this episode feels very violent to me. Like, it feels like the combat Mm -hmm. is much more personal, and they're actually showing, like, when Blue Streak got shot earlier, like, he gets shot straight in the stomach, right? Braun gets shot in the shoulder, and they actually take care to show him at this point being like he's kind of hunched over and Mirage is kind of like leaning into him 
And he's like, I, I may be, what is it? I can't transform, but I can still walk. And then yep. this this part always threw me off when I was a kid is that when Mirage says, hey, Ratchet's the doc, you know, let him give you a ride home. And Ratchet says, doctor's orders are. Now, it makes sense. He's, he's an ambulance. But as a kid, I remember thinking like, shouldn't he be called like mechanic, medical mechanic? Like that, like the fact that he used like a, like a human idiom always threw me off. I don't know why it threw me off so bad, but it was, it was, it may, always gave me pause when they call Ratchet a doctor. I've since come around, <laughs> but as a kid, I was like, you can't do that. He's not a doctor. Doctors work on, you know, squishy flesh creatures. Also, I want to take issue with your statement that Prime is apologizing for the utter failure. Okay. That's a little hard. <laughs> they, they, uh, they, it's they, true. They, they, they failed. They had one job. They failed <laughs> utterly. Nightbird didn't just get stolen. The university got demolished. <laughs> It's true. The, the roof didn't... was ripped off. <laughs> there were no casualties, though. There were no no human no human casualties. Only Autobot casualties. Sure, but they were there to protect Nightbird, and what did they do? Fail at protecting Nightbird. That's a huge fail. I just want to state for the record, they haven't failed quite yet. There's still a chance they can get her back. So <laughs> it's, it's a setback. It's not utter failure on my side of the board. Hoover's calling it utter failure. We'll see how this all shakes out at the end of our 21 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's fair. <laughs> well, back at the arc, we see the new security program at work. When suddenly Nightbird shows up sneaking around. She fires a rope from her wrist and scales the side of the volcano. And below, Spike and Prowl are riding in an elevator that we've never seen before, <laughs> wondering what Megatron wants with a ninja robot. Nightbird sneaks onto the top of the elevator as it descends. Prowl and Spike enter the bottom floor of headquarters as Nightbird sneaks in behind them. Yeah, it's a little bit of expositional dialogue with Prowl and Spike here. Like, why would Megatron want to steal Nightbird? And, and I like that Prowl says, like, I never understand anything the Decepticons do. <laughs> but, but... Way to be a good military strategist, Prowl. Aren't you supposed to do that? Isn't that exactly what you're supposed to do is figure out what the Decepticons do and why? Every military time... strategy. Every time the Decepticons do something, they turn to Prowl. He's like, I'm as surprised as you are. <laughs> I don't know. I don't understand anything that they do. But the lion, it, they do like this little like foreshadow, not foreshadowing, but more like leading into it is like as Prowl and Spike are exiting the elevator, he says like, well, we can't find her. We're just going to have to wait for her to come to us. And as he says it, she's jumping off the elevator, starts sneaking around the Autobot base. And it's cool to see the inside of Autobot base. And it's cool to see all these little vignettes that come up. First of which is Nightbird sees Sparkplug doing laundry. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, when I was watching the screen, like I never noticed this before, but it made me so happy when I saw that. Yeah, if you pause it, he seems to be carrying like some folded pants or maybe some towels or something. <laughs> he's just walking by and I see him for probably one second. One second. And it, it's it's so clearly not machinery. He's not carrying like stuff mm -hmm. for wheeljack or anything. It's clearly folded clothes and he's just walking by a doorway as Nightbird's sneaking around. Oh my gosh. Uh, but also just getting to see like the little like hallways of Autobot headquarters that you don't often get to see. Yeah. Almost exclusively we see like the family room where they all gather around Teletran 1, right? Occasionally we'll see like a couple other compartments around there, but not like the actual hallways and like the entries to the different rooms in the Autobot headquarters. So that that also makes this this scene very special. So she comes across those exciting new floor panels that the Autobots installed from the beginning of the episode and they're blocking her path and she stops to analyze them knowing not to touch them she climbs the wall and walks on the ceiling instead not setting off the alarms yeah they took care to do a thing here first of all they're showing those panels that wheeljack made and they're all glowing right and they're all like in a grid on the ground is this to say like don't walk here but that's more for the kids to remember what those things are but like so but when she's walking on the walls and the ceiling they do this thing where like static electricity sounds come out of her feet and like this yellow glow mm -hmm. comes out of her feet and then like she starts sticking to the wall and slowly walks up and then finally is like walking like she would on the ground but on the ceiling she does this again later on in the episode and they took care to show that sound again I don't know what that is, but it's some kind of like, I'm guessing static electricity, maybe like super static electricity to make her sticky. But either way, she's it's a ninja. ninja means... skills, kid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And that's the way we thought of ninjas back then is they could basically do anything. 
So sneaking up to a doorway, she spies on Prime, reassuring Braun that he'll soon be recovered. But then she runs down the hall in search of something else. Getting to Teletran 1, she opens a panel door, revealing that world energy chip mentioned before. She pulls it out, which dims the lights in the base. Prime and Ratchet are taken aback, but realize that this means they have an intruder. Nightbird places the chip in her back and tries to flee, but comes across Mirage in the hallway. The two scuffle, but Mirage manages to sound the alarm as Prime, Jazz, and Cliffjumper arrive. Hold on, I want to take I want to take issue with the word scuffle. She punches him in the throat, and you hear him make <laughs> a choking noise. Like that. This is another example of how this episode feels noticeably more violent than other Transformers episodes. The violence is very visceral and real and not abstracted like it is when they're doing like the imaginative fight scenes so mirage comes up on her he's like hey what's you and then before he can even do anything she punches him square in the throat and you hear him make a choking noise and then she just starts clobbering the heck out of him and he's just getting <laughs> bounced back and finally he reaches for the wall and hits the alarm so it's it's less of a scuffle and more like poor mirage just <laughs> he just gets clobbered but yeah so then prime jazz and cliff jumper show up Nightbird comes to a dead end as the Autobots shine their headlights onto her, revealing their enemy. She turns to face them, retracts her hands into her wrists, replacing them with saw blades, which roar to life as we fade to commercial. Yeah, so she can do the same thing Autobots can do with the whole hand inside the arm trick. Because I've pointed out the commercial break freeze frames that they've done in the past, like like noticing the really good ones, this one felt like it was like not so great. This is like kind of like three quarter up shot looking at her and her arms. She's got her arms like kind of like her elbows locked at her sides and her saw hands just like pointing straight out. And it's just like this. Well, it may and... not be very visually memorable, but it's very auditorily memorable for yeah. me because yeah. the sound effect is very loud that they use for that. That's true. So it's like all of a sudden these saws roar to life and it's like, and you know, you don't usually end the scene with like a high pitched sound. That's true. You know, it's, so it's a little unusual in that way. Yeah. There's no dialogue, right? It's just like, oh, got her cornered. Mm -hmm. We're advancing. Hands go in, saws, and then boom, fade to black. Yeah. yeah. In case we haven't expressly stated it, Nightbird doesn't speak. She's a ninja. She doesn't need to speak. Yeah. So here we are at our first commercial break. So I think maybe we could check out this commercial of Chuck Norris and the Karate Commandos and stay on theme. <laughs> and we will avoid making any of those Chuck Norris meme jokes from 15 years ago. <laughs> Chuck Norris Karate Commandos. Chuck Norris Super Ninja Reed Smith Kimo and other figures sold separately. New from Kenner. You're saying his name says it all. Look at that vest. That's such a vest. Way to go, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? While I play with my figures, I mean, one of the things that we did as children when we watched these cartoons is we were often eating very sugary cereals. What do you got in the cabinet, Hoover? Mm -hmm. I got some Fruity Pebbles, and coincidentally, there was even a Ninja commercial for Fruity Pebbles. <laughs> yes, Fruity Pebbles actually put a Ninja in their commercial there was a ninja-themed Fruity Pebbles commercial. I'm not making this up. Watch me do something outrageous to get French Fruity Pebbles with Newberry Blue. Bro ninjas! Give us your Fruity Pebbles and you could be a ninja like us. Me? A Berry Blue ninja? I got That's it. That's how popular ninjas were back then. <laughs> Even Fred Flood's turned in Barney Rubble <laughs> for ninjas at one point. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so uh, come on. I'm getting kind of ninja out, Hoover. <laughs> well, how about this commercial for the Cobra Ninja Storm Shadow who's saving Cobra Commander from the Joes? Cobra Commander got away, but we captured Storm Shadow. Yo, Joe! G.I. Joe Skyhawk. Joe and Cobra figures and Cobra claws sold separately from Hasbro. <laughs> uh, I miss those early G.I. Joe commercials. Something fierce. But I guess we can't play ninja commercials all the time, so let's get back to the show. And as we return, Nightbird is about to face off against the Autobots, her saw blades ablazing. Don't harm her, and definitely don't shake hands. Look out! It's a cute little quip from Jazz there. Nightbird throws her saw blades at them as the assembled Autobots duck. 
Thinking her now helpless, the Autobots go to rush her, but she pulls a Wonder Woman and spins in a circle, unleashing a blast of light at them. As the Autobots avert their gaze, Nightbird manages to escape, puzzling the Autobots with this ninja prowess of hers. Yeah, just like Batman in every Batman mm-hmm. cartoon, how he can just like sort of yep. disappear from the room while you're in the middle of a sentence. That's what mm-hmm. ninjas can do, too. They can always vanish when there's no apparent way that they can vanish. So back in the repair bay, Prime is grateful that Nightbird didn't do any permanent damage to anyone. But now they have to find her. Ratchet stays behind to repair Teletran and the injured Autobots and wishes them luck. Rolling out, Prime's team of Brawn, Mirage, Blue Streak, Hound, Jazz, and Cliffjumper happen upon Nightbird scaling a hill. Prime is able to stun her with a shot from his rifle, and they all approach her fallen body. But as Blue Streak approaches, she rises and attacks. She was playing Roboto Possum. <laughs> oh, oh, boy. <laughs> Robot opossum is a different thing than a titanium moose bot or a zap mice, right? Or zap mouse. Yeah. To be fair to the writers, this was one of those lines that stuck in my head as a child, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Same here. <laughs> That's a little too on the nose, if you ask me. But... <laughs> Robot opossum. Hats off to Peter Cullen, too, for delivering the line without any, like, you cannot detect any irony in his delivery. Like, he plays it right. perfectly straight, right? So, you know, I, that, that's another thing that I think is really special about this particular show. Well, most Sunbow shows is that they were all playing it straight. Nobody thought they were doing something. Well, if they thought they were doing something dumb, they sure didn't telegraph it. That's true. So opening a storage pocket on her side, she whips out ninja stars, throwing them towards the Autobots. <laughs> this irks Cliffjumper, who pulls out his gun, but Prime knows to shut that down before it starts, <laughs> saying that go. they promised that they wouldn't <laughs> harm her but also probably not wanting any Autobots hurt by Cliffjumper's poor aim. hey <laughs> So Nightbird then unleashes what is definitely not a lightsaber, though it no. sounds and looks just like one. No, it's not. It's not. Disney, it's not a lightsaber. <laughs> <laughs> and Prime carefully approaches her. She attacks and knocks Prime to the ground as the Autobots start taking aim but Prime still insists that she not be damaged. Blue Streak shoots the not lightsaber from her hands as Nightbird grabs Prime's rifle and escapes, jumping off the side of the cliff. Unable to detect where she went, the Autobots are left to her group. But with all the weapons she has, why would she steal your laser rifle? It's said the ninja always takes a part of an enemy with her. Thank goodness it was only my weapon. And then Cliffjumper wonders why she's attacking them in the first place, and Prime suspects Megatron can answer that. Which means we're going to cut to that amazing, amazing Decepticon-shaped mountain. <laughs> we cut back to temporary Decepticon out in the mountains. Megatron's watching footage of the battle that just took place. So either Laserbeak spying, or Nightbird somehow remotely recording. So, mm, I don't know. Mm. <laughs> Bombshell's impressed at Nightbird's performance, but Starscream is not. Ah, you burned out fast after the way Bombshell overtalked her circuits. Who asked you, Nitro Nose? Nightbird won't burn out until she returns with the computer chip we need. It's all been programmed. If she returns, you mean? She's not so hot. She's hot enough to replace you whenever I choose. That's a weird line. That's a weird yeah, line over at the end of that. It, it, well, it, it, <laughs> it is a weird line, but it's weirder because Starscream just happened to say she's not so hot. Yeah. If he had said she's not so great, then it would be less weird. But since he said she's not so hot, Megatron says she's hot enough to replace you whenever I choose. So yeah. then we get this sort of assumption that Megatron finds her attractive. <laughs> yeah, there's a there's a little bit of that in the way Megatron talks about her in this. There's a, there's a little bit of like this kind of like gross male possessiveness of her, like when he says <laughs> like my night bird and things like that. So yeah, yeah, I feel a little bit icky about this business in the episode, and and I don't know what their game was with writing it the the dialogue that way. Because also, she's not so hot doesn't sound like a very star screamy thing to say. 
feels, mm-hmm. you know, I don't know. You compare that to the way his dialogue was written again in season one, and, you know, it feels a little too informal. But mm-hmm. maybe I'm reading into that a little bit too, too tightly. I don't know. Well, we cut back to the Ark, and Ratchet has discovered that the chip is missing from Teletran. They've stolen the chip which itemizes the world's energy supplies. <laughs> it itemizes the world's energy supplies. So it's it's a it's a database or a spreadsheet of where all of the you know every oil refinery, power station, nuclear reactor, wherever energy is produced and or stored, it has the addresses. It's the index. It's the Rolodex of all the world's energy supplies. That apparently is what the energy chip does. But apparently it does more than that. (laughs) Ratchet gets Teletran up and running and notifies Prime about the stolen chip. And then we get this line. Whoever has that chip can tap into all the power supplies on Earth. Okay, so not only is it a spreadsheet, but it can get power from everywhere as well. That's a weird line. (laughs) That seems like an unnecessary device that's ridiculously overpowered. Definitely something that Megatron would absolutely want. This is like finding out that Batman has the, I mentioned Batman again, that he has the kryptonite ring in his house, right? It's like, mm. it's like the, the Autobots have a device in their base hooked up to their main computer that can like tap into power anywhere in the world. And we're just supposed to be like, well, you guys are nice. You won't use it. <laughs> you have it for a reason. This is weird. Everything is starting to feel like really menacing to me. And I noticed that Spike is nowhere to be found. So I point at that. <laughs> So Prime has Hound activate his infrared sensors to hunt for Nightbird as everyone follows. And a short drive later, they happen upon her, thinking her trapped. Prime tries to lure her out with her not lightsaber. It's not. But she's able to telekinetically retrieve it from him. It's not the force. She's not using the force because it's purple <laughs> electricity that comes out of her hand and attaches itself to the, the, the not lightsaber, Disney. Mm-hmm. Yep. We're joking about this a lot because when you watch the episode and listen to the sounds, they did nothing mm-hmm. to disguise it. It's a lightsaber. Mm-hmm. You could even hear Darth Vader breathing one of the times she's using the lightsaber. <laughs> <laughs> so Prime rushes her, but her swordsmanship is too great as she gets the drop on him as we head to our second commercial break. To describe the closing shot as we fade to black, it's literally her just like standing above him. Like he's in the foreground. It's fallen down and she's like approaching him with the intent to kill fade to black no weird sounds but again no dialogue and partially because nightbird doesn't talk so there's at least symmetry in that way so you know it seems like optimus could use some help here and since he lost nightbirds not lightsaber maybe he could use a real lightsaber let's <laughs> activate our star wars lightsabers inflation required it's the new star wars lightsaber from kenner inflation required batteries not included you can pretend you have powers when you switch on kenner's star wars lightsaber ready to feel the force <laughs> those cheerful boys in that room hitting a beach ball with inflatable lightsabers <laughs> well if optimus still needs some help after that maybe he could take some training from daniel san because nightbird is showing no mercy to him so let's have daniel san teach him from the karate kid discover the secrets of karate with karate kid try action figures concentrate daniel san they try twist and kick the karate kid and johnny are each sold separately and for more action look for the karate kid competition center from remco yes even the karate kid got action figures in the 80s kids <sighs> you know i i met him at a comic con that i was tabling at one mm. time and you know i i went and got an autograph and i said hi to him and i was shame on me i was surprised that he talked just like danny larusso <laughs> it's like oh i kind of thought you were putting on an accent lab but that's really the way you talk it was really cool <laughs> <laughs> I'm just laughing at you imagining him to have, have some sort of like refined English accent. And I don't know. The I, whole I, Danny LaRusso thing was a whole, it was acting. <laughs> That's what I thought it was. And so he was like, and I was tell, talking about the new Karate Kid show and he was like, yeah, I caught lightning in a bottle. And I was like, wow, <laughs> I did not expect, I'm getting the full experience here. Or maybe he was just doing that for me. But I tell you what, Hoover, this this high stakes battle, this this violent episode is stressing me out. So let's dial back to some good old fashioned thumb wrestling with the superstars of wrestling. Thumb wrestle anywhere with Hulk and the Iron Sheep. 
Dibs on the Sergeant Slaughter one. <laughs> Dang it. And the, the commercial ends with the iron sheet coming out to a bunch of children saying, okay, kids, back to class. And then all the kids go and start shouting at him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But now that my thumb is sore and now that I'm sufficiently t- wiped out because we didn't eat any cereal during this commercial break, I guess we should get back to it. See, see how this episode concludes. Well, choosing to not finish him off, Nightbird runs away, and the Autobots then give chase again. She attempts to scale up the side of a mountain, but falls below, back down to her pursuers. The Autobots draw guns on her, but some well-thrown ninja stars knock the weapons from their hands. Prime slowly faces off with her as Mirage invisibly sneaks behind her, retrieving Prime's rifle and tossing it to the boss. Prime says he regrets this and fires on her, knocking her to the ground as she recovers by throwing another set of ninja stars at them. The Autobots all try numerous attacks, but can never get the drop on her until Jazz suggests Cliffjumper use his glass gas. This scene is really, there's a lot of really lovely shots in this one. This is another good one for examining composition and like really celebrating the art of the Transformers Gen 1 cartoon series. There's mm-hmm. the shot when Optimus, he's like asking for suggestions. He's like, he's like, I'm open to suggestions and you don't gotta raise your hand. And he, he's looking over his shoulder at Cliffjumper when he says that. And it's another one of those really nice diagonal shots that has a lot of depth in it. And it has like frames up Cliffjumper really well. And it just highlights how well these characters are drawn in this one. A lot mm-hmm. of still storable moments in this one. Very much so. Every time you see someone's head, it just looks perfect. Yeah. There's really so does. many shots of Megatron smiling in this and they just look spot on. Yeah, oh, there's a lot of shots of Starscream like sort of gr- uh, grimacing at the camera. <laughs> <laughs> they all look really great. So, Cliff Jumper shoots glass gas and hooray, we see the return of sliding your hand into your forearm and out comes another device and he sprays mm-hmm. the gas at her, but what happens? Well, not even this works because she stops up his nozzle with a rocket. So can anything stop Nightbird here? Well, Jazz transforms, having something in mind, and out come his speakers as he unleashes a musical onslaught at Nightbird. Now this does the trick. Until she removes two discs from her legs, throwing them at Jazz's speakers, blocking the sound. Yep. Man, these Autobots can't catch a break. <laughs> So then we cut back to temporary Decepticon out in the mountains, and Megatron is watching the battle and loving it. Terrific! <laughs> yes, you're definitely on my replacement list, Starscream. <laughs> She's everything I've always wanted. Replace me? Never! Skywarp! Thundercracker! Rabbin! Soundwave! Bombshell, activate the cage. You can't keep me in here, Megatron! Ah! I don't see why not. That little cage was something I rigged up for the Autobots, but I'd like you to have it. Think of it as a a farewell gift. Wow, so that was a great little exchange. Uh, (laughs) You have Starscream being uppity. Uh Uh-huh. And finally, like Megatron acts on it, other than I'm going to shoot you any moment now. Oh, now something's come up. I don't have time to shoot you. Yeah. So gets to actually throw Starscream in a cage, which hurts him. (laughs) Yeah. Like Starscream screams really hard here. Also, unique moment in that when Starscream says, replace me. Never. He punches Megatron. He punched and Megatron falls Mm -hmm. to the ground and Starscream standing over him when Megatron says, Skywarp, Thundercracker, grab him. You know, he, he, He's on the defensive here. So like mm-hmm. it's it's a classic moment, a unique moment all at the same time. Also, this is something that Megatron always does wrong is like this whole idea of the main weakness of the Decepticons is the, the tyrannical aspect is that Megatron thinks that nobody's input is valuable. Ultimately, his, his is the only voice that matters in the room. And the moment you do that, you get a guy like Starscream and Starscream's the one rugged individualist in this organization. And he's going to throw a wrench in this. You can see it coming. Yeah, this is one of those rare times where basically Megatron taunts Starscream into action. And Starscream yeah. is actually so mad he punches Megatron. He punches him. Yeah. 
So Megatron returns to watching the battle on screen, but is saddened to find that the Autobots have overwhelmed Nightbird and placed her in an Electro Cage. And instantly Megatron is ordering a rescue mission not just for Nightbird, but because she has the chip Megatron can use to take total control of the world's energy supplies. So everyone heads out, except for Starscream of course, who's left in that energy cage. Yeah, that's the other mistake you made. You didn't leave a guard on the prisoner. <laughs> Yep. Because you don't need to, because you're Megatron, right? Well, there you go. But why do the Autobots have a chip that can control all the world's energy? <laughs> <laughs> I'm still wrestling with this, Hoover. <laughs> <laughs> so we cut back to the Autobots as they watch Nightbird attempt to escape her energy cage. As she thrashes around, the energy chip falls from her back, and Cliff Temper tries to retrieve it from the ground, only to be hit by Megatron's fusion cannon, because the Decepticons have just arrived. Keep your hands off my property, Otto Clod! Megatron, I knew it. Take him, Autobots! And now we're into full-on shooting across a field battle. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, like, Autobots on the left, Decepticons on the right. They're both running towards each other. It's almost like the season one intro. It really is. It's just not animated as, as well. But, I mean, in in a way, it makes it feel, again, more visceral. Like, the fighting feels more, like, I wouldn't say, I don't want to say real and have anybody misunderstand me. I mean real in the sense that it's unfortunate that it's not abstracted. This this feels a little bit too intense with everybody. Like, it feels chaotic. It feels mm -hmm. kind of like if it were to be done in a motion picture today, it'd be a lot of shaky cam stuff going on. Yeah. But, yeah, instead of the really imaginative kind of playing with the environment and the landscape and the fact they're robots, they're just running at each other with guns. And it's like, okay, I guess. <laughs> and of course, a battle erupts between the two sides. Cliff Jumper attempts to grab the energy chip off the ground, but Bombshell swings by and retrieves it. We have Braun firing at Bombshell, causing him to drop the chip, and then Prime catches it in midair. There's a really nice shot... Like, I mean, again, this is like, I'm just looking for something to love about this battle scene where Braun slides into the frame on the, like slides in, like I, I, he's not, he's standing up, but he's like, he's sliding in so hard. Like it's like, it's as if he was running really fast and then suddenly came to a stop, but he, because he's mm -hmm. Braun and he weighs so much, he's such a dense little robot. He drives two giant grooves into the desert floor <laughs> to like bring him to a stop. And then he points up and shoots. It's a, it's a nice looking moment that I guess if you're... Oh, I'm I'm consoling myself that this is just a bunch of macho shooting. <laughs> I'm looking for at least it's artful in some places. So Prime catches the chip, but then Megatron brandishes a previously unseen weapon, saying his antimatter blaster eats up energy. Okay, where was that Megatron? It was in this compartment over here with my invisibility spray. <laughs> Here's the, I got a whole bunch of weapons I've never told anybody about, and I'm saving them up for just one use. One. That's it. And I never use it again. Yeah, it's like a little pistol he's got. Mm -hmm. He fires it at Nightbird's electro cage, which dissipates it, allowing Nightbird to stand back up. Then we cut back to temporary Decepticon out in the mountains, and electro caged Starscream's watching the battle on the monitor. Megatron was nice enough to leave the TV on for him, <laughs> like you do when you have pets. <laughs> So Starscream launches a tiny little wrist rocket at the computer console, and he hits the perfectly right button. This dissipates his cage, freeing him, allowing him to go get involved in this showdown. Yeah, it's like it's like a little toy rocket that just kind of like goes boop and flies out of yep. his wrist and like like hits the button and just falls on the floor. It's like <laughs> what, this is the day for Decepticons to reveal little tiny weapons that they that. They never use again. One time with weapons. very specific actions. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine that it was like a fake rocket that he put in. He was gonna like launch it at uh, Skywarp one time just so he could <laughs> see Skywarp get all scared. <laughs> it's just a toy, you dummy. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like he's been saving up because like Skywarp pranked him once like five years ago. <laughs> And like he jumped and everybody laughed. He's like, oh, I'm going to remember that. And like he's waiting for Skywarp's <laughs> birthday. And then he's going to do that in front of everybody. Skywarp, I got you a present. <laughs> ah! <laughs> but then Skywarp doesn't dodge. He's like, what? And then, like, But Starscream still makes a big show of it. Like, ha ha, look at you. And everybody's just standing there just watching Starscream, trying to exult in it, but it's not working. <laughs> I'm not going to fault the writers 
for coming up with an imaginative little way for Starscream to get out of there. But like, it's a weird thing. Like it could have been like, there's a chip of metal on the ground. Could be that he bends a piece of metal off of the floor. Could be that, I, I don't know any number of things, but it's just weird. There was this little tiny rocket in his wrist that we've never seen before. So, so now Starscream's free and he approaches the battle, watching the other Decepticons and Nightbirds square off against the Autobots. He's sort of keeping to the back, keeping an eye on their things. As Megatron attacks Optimus, Starscream uses his Null Ray on the ninja and she collapses to the ground. Nightbird! No! Hey! Say goodnight to your Megatron! <laughs> what do you think Starscream was saying there? Well, there's a lot of question on the wiki. Like, was he supposed to be talking to Megatron and there was some other word in there to replace Megatron? But it almost seems like he's telling Nightbird to say goodnight to yeah, her Megatron. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, that, that sounds, that makes more sense. But this line has confused me ever since I was a child. And even as a kid, I was like, was he trying to say something else? And he just made a mistake? <laughs> was he just so worked up? He was like jumping, like tumbling over his own words. But say goodnight to your Megatron. I thought he was saying that to Megatron at first. And that doesn't make any sense. But you're right. If he's saying it to Nightbird, that totally makes sense. And he should have said that as he shot Nightbird with mm-hmm. the null ray. Yeah. But so maybe it's like placed in the wrong sequence or originally it was going to be something else. But it, it's yeah. awkward nonetheless. It's very awkward. And it's yeah, it felt awkward as a child. That it, it still feels awkward today. So, yeah, he says this and he laughs. And then what does he do? And he just flies off knowing that Megatron is <laughs> going to be utterly ticked. So then Megatron orders the Decepticons to give chase, saying he wants that traitor steel hide. So this is another situation where another Decepticon has irritated Megatron so much (laughs) that he's just calling a moratorium on the fight with the Autobots. Go get me that Decepticon who ticked me off. (laughs) First time it was the Insecticons. Yep. Now it's Starscream. Yeah, you know, it's like I want to put a little red circle around these moments as we go through the series because I feel like what happens after Transformers the movie to Megatron is beginning to make a little bit more sense. I I always pictured him as being like this really collected leader, but this guy's got some problems. <laughs> it's like, keep, keep your mind on the goal, Megatron. You had a, you had a goal. And, and the thing that you want is right in front of you. But now, like, your subordinate ticked you off. So you're just going to drop everything and chase him away. So Megatron has very pushable buttons. Yeah. And Starscream knows how to get to him. <laughs> I guess so, yeah. And that's why whenever Megatron says his name, he always shouts it. He never just says it. <laughs> <laughs> So the Decepticons are gone, and the Autobots have the deactivated Nightbird and the energy chip back. So this counts as a win. Oh, so it's not an utter failure. Hello, (laughs) ding, ding, ding. No, earlier was an utter failure. This was a success. Oh, I think it was a setback that led to success. (laughs) (laughs) So we cut back to the university, where Prime has returned Nightbird to Dr. Dr. Fujiyama, Fujiyama, the famous scientist. (laughs) And he is delighted to have her back, but makes the choice to safely lock her up so she won't be used for nefarious purposes ever again. But as we track into a close-up of her face, we see her eyes glow as she contorts her face into a scowl. And this is worth watching on the screen when you're watching the episode. Like, pay close attention because, like, they, they do this cool mm-hmm. thing where they kind of like roll the camera up to the inside. Like, Doctor Fujiyama, Fujiyama, the famous scientist, has put her in like this giant sort of cyber casket it's like mm-hmm. or it's almost like an mri machine right it's like a tube yeah. with a window on it to show her face because uh, also we see the scowl but the camera kind of like rolls up to the top of that and it pulls in on her face her eyes are like dark like she's deactivated but then the face twists like like the eyebrows like knit into like this angry mm-hmm. scowl and the eyes start glowing and first you hear this really scary noise as mm-hmm. the eyes are glowing but also, this freaked me out as a child. This ending super freaked me out because if you think about it, Autobots and Decepticons' mouths move, but the rest of their face is pretty expressionless, right? And mm-hmm. I remember listening to the audio commentary on Transformers the movie where Flint Dilly even said, like, oh, if you think about it, their faces are like almost angelic because they're statuesque. They just don't move except for the mouth. And I think that there's something to that observation so that when you have the eyebrows actually move 
on the character and the eyes changed shape, it felt different. It felt scarier. It felt like somehow her anger was so intense it allowed her face to emote in a way that no other Transformers face can emote. It'd be like the equivalent, and I'm saying this as an adult, I wouldn't have said this as an 11 year old, it'd be the equivalent of like your face splitting or doing something that human faces just don't do. It feels that off. Mm -hmm. And it still kind of makes me a little uneasy to see it today. I don't. I wouldn't say it frightens me, but it's like when I see it, I'm like, ugh. So, <laughs> as you know, I was kind of like taking issue with some of like the the commercial break fade to blacks. This one is an excellent fade to black. This is a great ending, mm -hmm. and it sets up the whole Nightbird saga happening in season three. <laughs> Unfortunately, that doesn't happen, and we never see Nightbird ever again. But so it's a nice little. Nice little cliffhanger for the possibility of her coming back in the future. It just never happened. Yeah. So that ends the episode, right? It ends yep. on the evil Nightbird's face, and we'll never find out what happens with that. But backing away and looking at the episode as a whole, how do you feel about it? I like it. It's enjoyable. It's fun to see Megatron made happy by some, not even a Decepticon robot. Mm -hmm. And it gets just weird enough to be okay but had it gone further it's like you you almost expect megatron to like give her a kiss or something <laughs> yeah <laughs> it, I, actually you know it's weird but at the same time i kind of appreciate like how they're kind of getting into weird territory whether they meant to or not with megatron and starscream Right. Mm -hmm. Because like there's this whole idea of like, well, he's kind of like talking about her like in this vaguely romantic way. And he's comparing her as a direct one to one with Starscream. Mm -hmm. Well, that's weird. Uh, you can come up with all sorts of conclusions based on that. We haven't had the conversation yet about like our issue with the whole idea of like Transformers even having gender. Mm hmm. And what that would even mean for their species. I think I think that might be getting a little bit to the weeds to talk about it here. Yeah. I actually think it'd be getting into the weeds to talk about it in any kind of lengthy way. And I'm not sure I'm the right person to have that conversation. But at the same time, I feel like, okay, exploring weird areas, that is, that's fair territory. And I actually think it's welcome territory. But... So, and I feel like this one gets like right up to the edge of making me go like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> In a traditional Sunbow way, it suggests but doesn't deliver, which is, you know, mm -hmm. something I, I appreciate about the series. But, but yeah, yeah, it's, I, I guess I still haven't finished processing how I feel about this one with the way <laughs> Megatron reacts to it. Cause like he also, he kind of like talks in a semi romantic way about like death machines. <laughs> so, <laughs> Megatron's just a mess. What up is guy. Nightbird, but yet the latest death machine? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I guess, I mean, like, it, it it fits a lot of the things that we like about the Transformers series as a whole. It's like the dysfunction of the Decepticons and their whole, like, Megatron's worldview being flawed in that his, his approach with tyranny always, you know, comes back to get him from within most of the time. Mm -hmm. Got a little bit of spike in there. You know, I, I like that this was largely an episode about a hero using a lot of restraint. You know, you got Cliff Jumper being like, yeah. that's it. You know, it's like she, he gets yep. hit by like 10 throwing stars. Like, all right, enough. <laughs> and I'm like, I get it. I get it, Cliff Jumper. That would suck. But, you know, like you guys made a promise, you know. So it has a lot of things I like, has some things that I think don't age very well. But at the very least, it has some lovely animation, at least like shot composition, art, and a couple of like really kind of creepy haunting moments. So, yeah, it's a mm -hmm. good one. Yeah, that that's my view too. It's 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 pretty good. It's not wonderful, but it it's memorable. It's an interesting concept. It's pleasant. You know, it's there's there's nothing about it that I can point out and go, well, I don't like that. Yeah, I mean, other than there's not a lot of Decepticon stuff in it. Yeah, I mean, Rumble and Frenzy get to talk, so that's cool. Mm -hmm. But Soundwave and Skywarp and Thundercracker don't say much of anything. So that's a little bit of a bum out. But other than that, you know, I really can't point to anything and go, well, that wasn't good. I feel, yeah, I feel like you and I, correct me if I'm wrong, Hoover, but I feel like we got spoiled a little bit by later iterations of the series where there was a smaller cast. So when we had like some characters that we really enjoyed in the series, we could be assured that they were going to get to yeah. say or do something that really came from their character, you know? Yeah, in Beast Wars, 
everyone gets a line in every episode in the first season, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I mean, I can't think offhand of any episodes missing a character because there were so few characters. Yeah. You have everybody in every episode and they all get a speaking line at least probably a lot more. But in this, that's starting out with like 20 something characters in season one, you can't ever do that. So, yeah. you know, you can't expect them to do it either. So, you know, you got to kind of walk that line with your expectations. But as far as this goes, I mean, it's good. I would say it's a solid A minus or something like that. I don't know. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would agree. It's a pretty good one. So, okay. Well then I guess there's nothing left to say except thank you for this fun discussion, Hoover. And what do we got next week? What's everybody's homework to watch before we well, tune in again? Well, let's just, let's just reflect briefly on how great the art was this episode <laughs> and how many great, wonderful drawings of characters' faces were here okay. and how, how many great characters' expressions we had. You're making me nervous. Because next up is the core. Oh, no. The core is... Yet another one, but I believe the last episode that was animated by ACOM for season two. So they're that company that don't draw so good. (laughs) Megatron is going to be off model a lot. They did the Autobot run and they did the City of Steel. (laughs) They did the Autobot run and City of Steel, which we've both already covered. And you probably heard how not enthused we were with with the art in those and this is going to be another one of those episodes but but, uh, i'll anticipate this i bet it's going to be another good one to listen to because i feel like those were two of our best discussions as we were like heroically trying to find something to love about those two city of steel was definitely our longest episode (laughs) and that that really surprised me it, well, it, it actually, the more I thought about it, uh, you know, and when going back and listening to it, too, it's like, yeah, it's, it's because we spent so much time really trying to find, like, you know, what were the things they were hitting mm-hmm. right? I think we did a good job of it. I think we did a good job of, like, balancing the scales on it. And so it wasn't just like a, a big, you know, we didn't just drag the episode for an hour and a half. <laughs> and same with the Autobot Run. I feel like there was there was some things that I, because I had always written off that episode as being like, ugh, you know, I roll. We wouldn't have gotten to Chip pushing his courage into his arms had we not. <laughs> which is like one of my favorite images of all time now. <laughs> I'm going to be like Chip today. It's going to be hard, but I'm going to push my courage all the way down to my arms so that I can push myself up and catch that ball <laughs> or catch that grenade. So, yeah, so maybe it's going to be a really good one. We'll see. I mean, it's going to be tough to to watch and like look for the good stuff in there, but... Well, The Core was definitely one of those episodes I did have taped off TV. I don't know what kind of weird luck I had to tape those ACOM episodes, <laughs> but they were often on my VHS. <laughs> there, there's at least two lines that I think are exemplary, well, to me, exemplary. There's like a Megatron line that I think is really good. And there's interaction between Optimus and Chip that I always, always loved. So there's at least that to look forward to. Chip will be back next episode, kids. Thank goodness. Okay, so we record this show weekly, and we release it on Thursdays at 4millionyearslater.com or your favorite podcatcher. If you are enjoying the show, a great free thing you could do free free in the sense of in terms of money it's not free in terms of time we'll take a few minutes of your time giving us a five-star review wherever you listen to us if you really want to be a hero like chip chase you can write a few things that you like about the show and each name three three things that you think make this show special and pleasurable for you and if you want to go watch the core right now and prepare yourself well it's can be found in season two as episode 24 on tubi tv thank so you for that. they they shoved that thing down to the end. <laughs> Probably for a reason. <laughs> they punted it downfield. Don't nobody look at this. <laughs> what? No, there's no episode called the core. What? Oh, that that core. <laughs> All right. Uh, so until next time, everybody, I've been Jersey Drozd of four million years later dot com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I have been Hoover the Night Turd. <laughs> Okay, bye. Bye. Episode synopses are from imdb.com and some episode information taken from tfwiki.net. 
closing theme is by Nick Mahalik, based on the original closing theme by Ford Kinder and Ann Bryant. You can find more of Nick's music at soundcloud.com slash nicholas Mahalik. That's spelled N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S dash M-E-H-A-L-I-C-K. Find us on Facebook under 4 Million Years Later, and you can email us at 4 Million Years Later at gmail.com. Visit 4 Million Years Later dot com, and if you haven't yet, please subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. You know how it works. <laughs>